Over the course of World War II, Germany and various other militaries faced a potentially crippling challenge. Supply chain issues with important metals, most prominently copper. A lack of copper, used for the manufacture of brass bullet casings, meant that the assembly of ammunition would be hampered. As a simple alternative, most militaries settled on substituting brass with more widely available steel. But given that steel casings are not as reliable as brass, Germany also attempted to speed develop a secondary alternative, a caseless form of ammunition that would hypothetically make traditional bullets obsolete. Of course, no longer needing to source expensive copper is a benefit that speaks for itself, but that is just the start of the advantages that caseless ammunition promised. Caseless rounds are also beneficial in terms of weight reduction, cost reduction, and overall reliability, all while still ideally being as versatile as their cased counterparts. However, attempts by military researchers and engineers to develop a perfect caseless cartridge fell short, and, well, they've fallen short ever since. Now we'll get into more details shortly, but the fact of the matter is that modern firearms have been so carefully and thoroughly honed around cased bullets that the two are simply inseparable. Or to put it another way, a Achieving the firing rate, muzzle velocity, reliability, and convenience of a modern firearm is enormously challenging when removing the brass case from the equation. In the case of World War II, Germany did achieve some degree of success experimenting, but never actually producing the 55mm MK115. The 115 was an enormous 180kg autocannon designed to be mounted to an aircraft. The gun was noted for rear ejecting propellant gases, effectively making it recallless, as well as for using innovative partial combustible cartridges. Only the base of each cartridge ejected when spent, so although the 115 wasn't a truly caseless ammunition weapon, it was a moderate step in that direction. Japan, on the other hand, did in fact develop and produce a truly caseless ammunition in that same time period, though in this case the cartridge was far more akin to a small rocket than a traditional bullet. The specialized rounds, developed in conjunction with the 49kg 40mm HO301 autocannon, contained a 10g silk bag of smokeless powder housed within the projectile itself, doing away with the need for a separate brass case. When the primer was struck and the propellant ignited, the contained pressure burst an aluminium cap and gas is ejected through a small exhaust port, providing thrust. The key takeaway here is that the projectile housed all the components of the ammunition, a configuration referred to as an internal propellant bullet design. In principle, 301 cartridges were pretty straightforward, and we even know that they were tested in a real-world combat environment. So, I guess that means the case's ammunition was cracked decades ago, and there's no reason the design shouldn't be widespread, right? Well, quite the contrary, as you probably know. All the 301 did was solidify the many problems with caseless bullets, prominently demonstrated by the autocannon having an effective firing range of just 150 meters and a paltry muzzle velocity of 245 meters per second. For comparison, the HO5 firing traditional rounds had an effective range of 550 meters and a muzzle velocity of 735 meters per second. So it's not surprising that following World War II, caseless ammunition fell out of favor almost entirely. The concept of caseless ammunition, however, remained very much alive and relevant. Various forms of caseless cartridges have been in development to some extent ever since, with countless militaries eager to take advantage of a lighter bullet at a dramatically reduced cost. With that being said, caseless rounds are still not standard, and that really does beg the question, how can removing a brass case from a cartridge be so challenging as to not be achievable despite decades of effort and hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars being thrown at the problem. Now look, a traditional bullet design includes a primer, propellant, held together by a case. Once the primer is struck and detonates, the propellant is ignited and the projectile is pushed up the barrel by expanding gases. The means by which the empty case is ejected and a new cartridge is fed into the firing chamber varies with the cycling mechanism operated either by weapon recoil, blowback, or some of the expanding gas. The rate at which the mechanism cycles will also vary, with automatic weapons able to cycle multiple times per second. It's all pretty ingenious, and the intricacies of these mechanisms have been perfected, technically speaking, over centuries. But now, let's take the projectile part of the cartridge, telescope it, and create an internal space to house the propellant and the primer. But keeping in mind the shortfalls of the rocket-like HO301 ammunition, to increase the effective range and boost muscle velocity, let's remove the vents and add more propellant. And just like that, the case is gone, and as a byproduct, the intricate repeating mechanism is dramatically simplified. The result must surely be a more refined firearm. 
The experimental VAG-73 machine pistol was specifically designed to use this type of internal propellant caseless bullet, and the details are pretty impressive. Soviet engineer Gerasimenko set about the project in the 1970s, intending to prove that a new 7.62mm caseless cartridge could not only be viable, but far superior to a cased round. On the surface, his design seemed to be a breakthrough, offering a small 1.2 kilogram pistol that was self-cocking, capable of both single and burst fire, plus took advantage of a dual magazine that dramatically upped expected capacity to 48 rounds. But the critical problems became very apparent very quickly. The issue wasn't the pistol, it was the ammunition. It turned out that the rocket-adjacent bullet blasted ignited propellant out of its rear, very quickly building up mechanism-jamming residue inside the pistol. And it wasn't long before malfunctions began to occur, and testing sessions were cut repeatedly short as the machine pistol had to be disassembled and cleaned. Now, efforts were, of course, made to counter the residue buildup problem, but the most logical solution was to simply cut down on the amount of propellant, thereby also reducing the residue buildup. Reducing the propellant in a cartridge, though, really can only have one outcome, a very low-velocity bullet with a severely limited range, as with the HO301. Caseless rounds with reduced propellant are often so low-velocity as to be subsonic in most cases, and although subsonic bullets do have their place, it's clear that the compromises are quickly starting to outweigh the caseless cartridge benefits. But let's just be clear about something here. Repeating mechanisms using traditional cartridges also fail fairly frequently, with the most common issues being a misfire or a brass casing trapped within moving parts before it can be properly ejected. The exact causes of a failure in a traditional firearm will differ, ranging between the quality of ammunition, the firearm not being cleaned or properly maintained, or the weapon itself having a design flaw. The M16 is a prime example here, so notorious for failing during the Vietnam War that the widespread outrage of soldiers eventually triggered an investigation. The key is that the M16 was eventually replaced by the far more reliable M16A1, demonstrating that firearms using caseless rounds don't have to be faultless, they simply have to have a failure rate that is equal to or better than traditional firearms. So, as you can see, for caseless rounds to still be viable, what we need is an improved design that eliminates, or at least improves, the residue buildup problem. It just happens that such a design exists. So let's turn our attention to the Vore VEC-91 and the external propellant caseless round. Courtesy of Austrian firearms manufacturer Vora, the VEC-91 was exported commercially to the USA in 1993. The bolt-action rifle, intended primarily for the hunting community, was a revolution in many ways, seeming to indicate that the world was on the brink of a new, futuristic era of firearms. Most prominent was that the VEC-91 was based around UCC ammunition, or the Usel caseless cartridge. UCC ammunition is of an external propellant design using nitrocellulose as its core. The nitrocellulose is cast into a solid structure resembling a traditional bullet case with the primer and projectile partially or fully housed inside. When the primer detonates, the solid external propellant burns away entirely, thus leaving the chamber empty and ready to accept another round. The VC-91 was, however, revolutionary in more than just the type of ammunition it used. For starters, the firing mechanism was electronic, operated by a pair of 15-volt tri-cell batteries housed in the pistol grip. When the trigger was pulled, the battery simply detonated the primer near instantaneously, saving milliseconds of so-called lock time. Lock time here refers to the micro-delay that occurs between pulling the trigger and the firing pin and striking the primer, ranging from between 2.6 to 9 milliseconds. And look, milliseconds might not seem like a big deal, but for any long-range shooting enthusiast, a perceivable delay is the difference between a hit and a miss. Simply put, the VEC-91's electronic firing system provided a level of stability, responsiveness, and accuracy that was all but unprecedented, surely putting it at the top of any hunting enthusiast's wish list. Add to these the benefits that the VEC-91 was capable of a muzzle velocity of up to 930 meters per second, that it also came complete with a Monte Carlo-style worn-out stock, checkered grip, high cheek rest, adjustable trigger, plus five-round magazine, and it really does seem like the ambitious rifle should have been a smash hit. But since you've probably never heard of the VC-91, unless you're a firearms aficionado, you can already guess that the rifle was a resounding failure. It has since all but vanished from the United States, begging the obvious question, what went wrong? Well, let's start by looking at the external propellant style of ammunition and once again reiterate that attempting to redesign the wheel comes with a host of unforeseen consequences. The first and biggest flaw of external propellant ammo is heat. 
With cased ammunition, the metal assists greatly with heat buildup, serving to not only insulate, but also to remove heat from the system ejecting it. And yes, look, ejecting hot brass is a problem onto itself, and having a scolding case slip down the back of your shirt is incredibly painful, but that risk is nothing in comparison to the caseless ammunition nightmare that is cooking off. Cooking off refers to a weapon building up so much heat that when the next bullet is chambered, it fires off spontaneously, often creating a chain reaction that cooks off every round in the magazine. The cause of this problem with external propellant cartridges is the relatively low ignition temperature of just 170 degrees Celsius, making the ammunition virtually useless in automatic weapons. Now, the VC-91 avoided the cooking off issue by being bolt action, so it wasn't this flaw that caused its commercial failure, which we'll get to in a moment. As far as external propellant bullets are concerned, there are solutions to cooking off. One solution is designing a gun that fires from an open breech, such as the Mac-10 submachine gun. The Mac-10 also had a cooking off problem, though the issue was mitigated by the working parts of the gun being held to the rear of the receiver when not firing, thus leaving the bullet chamber empty. A fresh round is only chambered once firing commences, providing a workaround that is effective no matter how hot the weapon gets. The open breech solution does come with disadvantages though, the most prominent being that such mechanisms are known to be unstable and fail when jolted, or rather ironically resulting in rounds being fired off spontaneously. Sadly for external propellant cartridges, the cooking off issue is just the start of the drawbacks. Another factor, and another often overlooked function of standard bullets, is sealing. The case of a standard round expands when fired, creating a perfect seal that allows gases to propagate forward and push the projectile in the desired direction. Given that there is no case to serve this function in caseless designs, the expanding gases are not properly controlled, and so projectile accuracy and muzzle velocity is affected, amongst other issues. There are workable solutions to this problem as well, but let's just say that effective sealing is just another challenge adding to overall inconvenience. It's the third issue with external propellant rounds that really starts to tip the scale of compromise and make the cartridge type undesirable. And that's that the rounds also happen to be fragile. The solid propellant holding the components together is entirely exposed to the elements, and so at any point the propellant may come into contact with water, dirt, gun oil, or just about any other contaminant that may be encountered in the field. Once the propellant is polluted, the chances of misfiring go up exponentially, and there really isn't much more that needs to be said about that. Now, going back to the VC-91, let's wrap up what killed the rifle. The final nail in the coffin was, above all else, that getting hold of UCC ammunition was a nightmare. Assembling standard case ammunition is relatively simple, and virtually all commercial manufacturers were, and still are, set up for that process. Assembling UCC ammunition, meanwhile, is highly specialized and significantly more complicated, requiring a manufacturer to invest in an entirely new production chain. The bottom line is that no manufacturer was willing to step in and take on that challenge, especially given the required heavy investments in what was really a niche product. More to the point, anyone that had purchased a VC-91 certainly couldn't handcraft their own ammo, as is possible with case rounds, meaning that the expensive rifle was transformed into a useless paperweight. Despite everything we've just said, Caseless ammunition is in no way a lost cause. The US and probably many other militaries are still actively researching forms of caseless ammunition as we speak. In one case, an assault rifle using caseless rounds very nearly even went into full production, though fell just short of the finish line. We're talking about the primarily West German-developed Heckler & Koch G11, probably the most well-known caseless ammunition-based firearm and a standout in the American Advanced Combat Rifle Program. The long and extraordinarily complicated development of the G11, stretching between the 60s and the 90s, probably deserves a dedicated video of its own, but let's just say for now that it was an absolute mission. To improve on the cooking off problem, which had resulted in the G11 being withdrawn from the 1979 NATO trials for it, Heckler & Koch eventually partnered with German weapons and chemical company Dynamit Nobel to create an alternative solid propellant with a higher ignition temperature. The sealing problem was also tackled and supposedly solved, though we don't have time to go into the details of that right now. Again, if we make a full video about it, we can absolutely do that. The bottom line is that the West German military was signed up to accept a shipment of 300,000 G11s only for the project project to unceremoniously collapse. A combination of the issues we've discussed, an extremely high production cost due to the rifle's absurd complexity, a struggle with meeting NATO standards, and various other political factors all came to a head, and the G11 is now not much more than an oddity. 
The good news is that the technology developed for the G11 is not going to waste. Everything relating to the abandoned assault rifle is currently being licensed by the Lightweight Small Arms Technologies Project, with sights currently set on a new light machine gun for the US military. The kicker, however, is that intentions are for the new machine gun to use rounds with plastic cases rather than the established caseless rounds. We didn't look into how plastic cases are beneficial, or perhaps even better than caseless rounds, but maybe we'll do so in a future video. Again, want that? Let us know in the comments. As it stands today, there are types of cases ammunition that are being used, though specifically only in conditions that avoid the obvious drawbacks. A good example is the Russian AGS Balkan 40mm automatic grenade launcher adopted by the Russian military in 2017. The design of the grenade launcher obviously doesn't allow for much in the way of heat buildup, and so caseless rounds are the obvious choice. A partially combustible cartridge is also used in the Rheinmetall RH120 tank. There's no direct lineage, but these rounds can be thought of as a distant cousin to the World War II 55mm 115 autocannon. So, well, that just leaves us with the future, doesn't it? And the chances are pretty good that we'll be seeing more caseless ammunition designs before long. The technology is still very much in the eye of global militaries, and it isn't a stretch to say that caseless rounds are almost certainly due for another comeback. And when they do, well, we'll return and we'll tell you all about it. Thanks for watching.